Hello, top of the morning to you. Welcome to our special coverage of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm Alumide Macaulay. The headlines, Russia and Ukraine confirm attack on each other's airfield. Russia says genetic tests confirm Wagner chief Prigozhin died in plane crash. Thank you so much for joining us. We start with Russian claims of destroying a military aircraft airport in Kiev, the capital and most populous city of Ukraine, while Ukraine claims a drone attack against a Russian military airfield in Kursk, a city and the administrative center of Kursk Oblast. This is the latest in a series of tit-for-tat fighting as the war between both countries intensifies. The Russian Defense Ministry reported on Sunday that the Russian armed forces launched a strike with long-range airborne precision weapons against an airfield in Kiev region, hitting all designated targets. The report says on the same day, Russian Army's air defense systems shot down two Su-25 fighter jets of the Ukrainian Air Force, intercepted nine HIMARS rockets and 30 unmanned aerial vehicles. Meanwhile, Ukraine said on Saturday night it launched a drone attack on a Russian military airfield in Kursk. Citing sources from the security services of Ukraine, the National News Agency of Ukraine reported the attack as successful. Also on Sunday, Russia's National Defense Management Center said its radar system detected a U.S. MQSA Reaper drone in the Black Sea region. The center said it sent a Su-30 fighter to escort the drone to prevent it from entering Russia's airspace. According to the center, the U.S. drone flew off the Russian border when the Russian warplane approached to prevent the border violation. At least two people have been killed in an overnight Russian missile attack that hit a vegetable oil plant in central Ukraine's Poltava region. Governor Dmitry Lunin and a presidential official said as a result of the attack, two people were killed and two people were also taken to hospital with minor injuries. And the whereabouts of two more people are currently unknown. Governor Lunin adds that the strike was on an industrial facility without providing further details. Ukraine's presidential chief of staff, Andriy Yeromak, said on Telegram the missile struck a vegetable oil factory in the Mirhorod district, killing two people and injuring five others. The Ukrainian military said Russia launched four missiles from the Black Sea overnight, two of which were shot down. The military reported that the Krivy region, also in central Ukraine, was hit by missiles as well. Local authorities say several private houses were damaged, but they did not report casualties. Local authorities in the southern Russian Kursk region near the border town with Ukraine say a drone crashed into a multi-story apartment building on Sunday. Kursk Governor Roman Starovoit posted photos of the attack's aftermath on his Telegram channel, adding that windows were shattered in several buildings, but there were no fires nor casualties. Another drone was shot down on Sunday over the Bryansk region in Russia's west, but there was no further information about possible damage or casualties, Russia's defense ministry said on their Telegram messaging channel. Meanwhile, it appears Moscow's airports are operating normally after a temporary flight suspension was Go imposed the in the early hours of Wednesday last week. Russia's state aviation authorities say the airports are back after security forces thwarted an attempted drone attack on the Russian capital. The Russian Defense Ministry said early on Wednesday that air defense systems had downed three drones that had tried to attack Moscow. Russian officials have confirmed Wagner chief Yevgeny Prigozhin dead after genetic analysis of bodies found in Wednesday's plane crash. The investigative committee said the identities of all the 10 victims had been established and corresponds to those on the flight's passenger list. The private jet crashed two months to the day after Prigozhin led an aborted mutiny against Russia's army top brass. President Vladimir Putin describes that incident as a treacherous stab in the back, but later met with Prigozhin in the Kremlin. 
He sent his condolences on Thursday to the families of those the aviation agency said had died in the crash. Many people have been reacting to the confirmation of Prigozhin's death, meanwhile, by Russian investigators. Those visiting a makeshift Wagner Memorial in the center of Moscow on Sunday say the group founder was a real hero. Russia's aviation agency had previously published the names of 10 people on board the private jet which crashed in the Vir region northwest of Moscow. They included Prigozhin and Dmitry Utkin, his right-hand man, who helped found the Wagner Group. Russian investigative committee said on Sunday that the results of the genetic tests had confirmed the identities of all 10 people who died in the plane crash. And Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky says voting could take place during wartime if partners shared the cost. Legislators approved and everyone got to the polls. He was responding to calls by a U.S. senator this week to announce elections in 2024. Elections cannot currently be held in Ukraine under martial law, which must be extended every 90 days and is next due to expire on November the 15th after the normal date in October for parliamentary polls, but every presidential election, which will normally be held in March 2024, Top American legislators visited with Kiev on August the 23rd, amongst them Senator Lindsey Graham, who ha heaped commendation on Kiev's fight against Russian President Vladimir Putin and said the country needed to show it was different by holding elections in wartime. President Zelensky, in a television interview uh, with uh, an anchor for their news channel, said he'd discuss the issue with Mr. Graham, including the question of funding and the need to change the law. The interview was uploaded on the office of the president of Ukraine's channel. Now joining us is Mr. Chidiwanu, security expert who does join us from out of London in England. Good morning and welcome to the program today. Good morning. Thank you for having me. How are things in, in England? How are things in the UK? We know that there's still a lot of attention on the war in Ukraine. What's the current sentiment? Well, um, things in England are good. Today we have sunshine. It's a public holiday here in England, so I'm dressed down. <laughs> but um, the sentiment is, is the same. Um, there is broad support for Ukraine's uh, aims, uh, both amongst the political class, across all parties. There is no major or even minor party in the UK that has uh, an anti-Ukraine or a pro-Russia slant, unlike what you would see maybe on continental Europe or in the United States. The public is broadly supportive of Ukraine. There is a, a general support for Ukrainian people. As well as the civilians. And, uh, and it's unlikely to change um, for a long time unless something dramatic happens. Well, there's nothing like comfort food if you're out uh, whining and dining. And if the weather is uh, appropriate, there's nothing like dressing down, as you just mentioned. And yes, it is apt. But Mr. Wanu, let us turn our attention now. Now we know how things are in London, as you've shared with us, to the Prigozhin uh, death and the the falling out of the sky of that plane. For anyone who's, who's followed any sort of air accident and seen and heard in the cases where maybe in the 9-11 attacks, uh, in September 9-11, the, the, the Twin Towers, uh, and it was shared publicly afterwards, uh, discussions on the phone with the, uh, with the people that perished, the, the sheer horror of being in an airplane that is being downed is, cannot be explained. You know, it's, it's, it's a horrible thing. And, but we don't know whether the plane was shot down. We don't know whether there was, an, there was sabotage of the plane. They've not talked about recovering the black box. This happened in Russian airspace. What were your initial reactions to this incident? And did you think there was a foul play involved from the get-go? Um, yes, is the short answer. I mean, this is a, it's a very Russian 
uh, episode, you know, it's a mystery wrapped in an enigma, you know, uh, covered in a riddle. Um, what we know for sure is that a plane came down um, through some means or other, and we know that 10 people died. What we don't know is the identity of everybody that died, and we don't know what caused that crash. And this is the crux of the matter, mm-hmm. in that a, a plane crash is a very convenient way to kill somebody, but it's also a very convenient way to fake your own death. So without going into the realms of, of conspiracy theories, I'm just going to look at things from the perspective of, as I said, we know what we know. A plane crashed and 10 people died, but what there were also certain possibilities. The, the first possibility is that Pigosian and his deputies were on that plane and it, and it crashed either through sabotage or, you know, as is suspected, uh, an attack from air defense or any other means. Now, in that case... There are a whole range of other of issues that you look at that we, as such as who perpetrated this attack. The key suspect is obviously, um, you know, the Putin or the Russian security services. Uh, but there are also other suspects. It could very well be the Ukrainians. Uh, very unlikely, but it could be the Ukrainians. It could be fellow oligarchs or fellow other actors, uh, people working for Shoigu or Grasimov, who saw, you know, the opportunity to take their revenge. It could be a whole variety of actors who decided to take Prigozhin out. What that tells you then about the, the general situation in Russia is, you know, without being, you know, overdramatic about it, it's a very mafia style uh, environment where, you know, you've got groups of people who would use violence, not just to get their aims, you know, generally, you know, uh, like with the invasion of, of Ukraine, you know, in a geopolitical sense, but internally they will settle scores with violence without worrying about collateral damage. So if we've got to bear in mind that, you know, for, for the most part of it, the crew members, at least, were not Wagner people. So at least three innocent people, including a, you know, a young lady, were, were killed you know, just like that. So that's one perspective. The second perspective, obviously, is that, as I said, um, maybe he didn't die. Uh, maybe he wasn't on that plane. Because the only evidence we have of Bogosian being on that plane is that his, it his, was his plane and his name was on the manifest. However, there's no video footage of him boarding that plane, you know, going through an airport, any airport nowadays, you're videoed on CCTV many, many times. If the Russians really wanted to put this to death, they would, um, you know, release footage of uh, Prigozhin boarding the plane. They would produce some conclusive evidence that he was actually on that plane. There is none of that evidence that's been revealed. It doesn't mean he wasn't on the plane, but it's just, we don't know. Um, Saying that you've identified the body or there's DNA, well, that you know, as you say about you know elections, it's it's not it's not who votes that's important. It's who counts the votes. So it's not who se- who identifies. Uh, or, you know, it's not what the body is identified as. Who is, is claiming to have identified the body? So the most important factor about all of this, though, that I, from my perspective, is that it is in a lot of people's interest for Prigozhin to be dead. It's in Prigozhin's interest for him to be dead because he's now no longer the target of revenge by fellow oligarchs, by Grasimov, by Shoigu, by Putin, uh, by the Ukrainians. It's in Putin's interest for Prigozhin to be dead because Prigozhin challenged him, publicly challenged him, led a, a mutiny against Russia, humiliated Putin and, you know, exposed in this mafia-like environment Putin's weakness. It's in Ukraine's interest for uh, Prigozhin to be dead because with Prigozhin dead, that brings problems in Wagner. So there's, a, there's going to be a huge fight now over not just the Wagner fighters who are, to be honest, not necessarily that much of a big problem without the support of the Russian state, but about Wagner's assets in Africa and beyond. Uh, Wagner has oil, has oil, Wagner, what we call Wagner, the framework of Wagner, has oil um, uh, contracts, it has mining contracts, it has security contracts. He's a huge money spinner. And very importantly, they are sanctions busting uh, kind of uh, um, concerns. With gold trading, you can bust sanctions. You can put, put money into the, into the gold mining, take, it, take all your gold into Dubai, sell it, and that's just free money without any trace, and that's not going to be covered by sanctions. The same with oil, the same with all the security contracts. We, we, by using the CAR, we're using Mali or Burkina Faso. Russians can trade with the rest of the world. Against high tech cooperative oligarch, but also for Russia as a conversion to be dead. So, what is dead or whether he is alive? He's we do apologize for a partial glitch in the audio of Mr. Wawanu, but uh, Mr. Wawanu, if you can hear me now. It's interesting, it's very, macab- yes, it's very macabre, macabre that you say that it's in Prigozhin's own interest for him to be dead, and you enumerated the reasons why. Not so long after the plane crash did 
the conspiracy theories start flying left, right, and center. There have been even sightings of him, just like the Elvis Presley sightings after Elvis passed on. The Tupac Shakur sightings say that after he died, they saw him somewhere in the Bahamas sipping on a pina colada. They say they saw Prigozhin somewhere in the Central African Republic. But with this DNA testing, does it, does it not actually put paid to any um, argument that he may indeed be alive? And also, could you speak to the fact that President uh, Alexander Lukashenko of Belarus said that he warned him twice about uh, his security? He warned him about uh, a pending fatal uh, attack. So, I mean, you know, in terms of the, the DNA uh, confirmation, it, again, I, one has to take that with a certain uh, amount of, um, you know, caution, because, as I said, it's, it's in the interest of the Russian state for him to be dead. It's in Prigozhin's interest for him to be dead, even if, if for example, it wasn't the Russian state that was behind this or, and he was still alive. You know, it's not beyond his means to, you know, fabricate um, a DNA kind of um, confirmation. So I, I think, you know, I, I, again, I put that to one side. There is, in my mind, unless it's a completely independent um, investigation, there is no way that whether we will know that whether Prigozhin was killed on that plane or not. Now, as per the sightings of Prigozhin, again, that's standard in any situation such as this. You know, he will pop up everywhere, just like, as you said, just like Elvis and Tupac. You know, he might feature in a few rap videos, you know, for all we know. It's just... It, it, everybody will say they've seen Prigozhin. I don't know how somebody randomly sees Prigozhin in Central African Republic. That's, you know, it's not, it's not the most uh, uh, camera-saturated place on the planet. So we should expect all these sightings. Um, again, this is a play in many parts. You might suddenly see a Prigozhin video appearing from somewhere. You might, you know, you, it, he might suddenly, uh, you know, start releasing audio tapes like Osama bin Laden. We have no idea. This is, as, as you know, as I said at the beginning, it's a very Russian uh, episode. It's very much in keeping with, you know, how Russian politics, you know, for, for centuries has played itself out. Um, but I, I think, you know, from, a, from an analysis point of view, what we need to look at is Prigozhin has, for whatever reason, been removed from the picture. And the questions we then need to ask ourselves is what is the effect of that? For us in Africa, we need to f factor in that Wagner had significant concern, uh, you know, business concerns in Central African Republic, Sudan, Mali, you know, looking at Bikini Faso, you know, sniffing around this year. What does that mean for us? What happens if those uh, units are now leaderless and decide to go independent? What happens if the Russian state takes them over and they are now working rather than, you know, in whatever way in support of those uh, countries, governments, but in support of Russian aims? What does that mean for us in Africa? What does it mean for us in Nigeria? If Wagner or what the, where is um, what is the the next stage of Wagner enters into Niger or enters into Benin Republic, what does it mean for us? Do we do we work with them? Do we work against them? What happens when the West comes in to counter them? Do we work with them? Do we counter them? Do we try and be neutral? There are many many implications of this that we as you know to, to be honest as Africans need to be thinking of. The drama of Prigozhin's life is a drama for the Russians. For us. It's the second and third order effects, the ripple effects that are going to come down the line to us as Africans. And we need to be very brutal with ourselves about it. We are not anybody's problem. Nobody cares what happens to us. Nobody cares how many Africans will be killed. This is, this is a playing field for everybody. So I, I, I would think at this point, African government should be putting their heads together and saying, this is an issue. Let's, have a, let's, let, let's kind of formulate a policy and present you know, something to the Russian government to say, if Wagner is going to operate in Africa, we want you to stick to these guidelines. We want you to follow the, the rules of uh, our, lo our the laws of our conflict. We want to have some sort of an oversight of it. And, you know, try and prevent what is essentially an internal Russian battle spilling over into Africa and, you know, creating problems in Africa. Indeed. These are very pertinent uh, post prigozhin Wagner mercenary group questions that I guess time will tell. And one major one will be who will be at the helm Will Wagner be rudderless or not? But let's leave that for the moment and go to the counter-offensive and the war uh, in Ukraine. Could you quickly uh, speak to the fact that it has caused a humanitarian crisis? According to the United Nations, at least 25.8 million border crossings since the Ukraine uh, war began. Some people are taking refuge in Belarus, 16,000 plus uh, some people went to Russia as well. Some people are in Poland and the other countries that surround uh, 
Ukraine. These are people obviously who don't have the stomach for the loud bangs and explosions of war. So they had to flee their country, essentially refugees. Now at this stage, do you see any demonstration of good faith on either for the Ukrainians? Well, obviously we don't see that yet. Or maybe for the Russians who say they want to end the war, but that the West is prodding and using Ukraine, going as far as causing, calling Ukraine, well, uh, <coughs> uh, calling the West masters of Ukraine. So I, I would say, so Khrushchev, I just returned from Central Europe and, you know, there were, there were quite a few Ukrainians, you know, uh, you, you'll see them or hear, you know, they, you'll hear Ukrainian or Russian being spoken. You'll see them, you know, at the airports, at, you know, uh, bus stations. And there's a there's a large community of Ukrainians and generally there is a, quite a lot of support for Ukraine. However, the, the reality, the, the, the so, you know, we started the program with how the Ukrainians are viewed in the UK and I said support is, you know, almost universally very high. Um, that's because we are divorced from the war. The war is not on our borders. We don't. We didn't take the most refugees. The, the Ukrainian war is having an indirect effect on our economy, but not a direct effect on our economy. However, in the countries bordering Ukraine, they are, there, there is a completely different dynamic. They are very supportive of, of the Ukrainians, but there are nuances, there are caveats. First and foremost, all of them, every single country bordering uh, Ukraine uh, has suffered Russian uh, occupation, Russian colonization. So there is that inherent fear and dislike of Russia uh, and an, an understanding of what Russian aggression looks like that colors a lot of their reaction. But then there's the reality that these are many of them are small countries. They're not as... Um, they're not as uh, wealthy as, you know, Western European countries. And it's, there was a huge burden on, on them in terms of, you know, catering for the refugees. There's also the economic factor in that Russians were a huge part of the economy of many of these countries, either through investments in, you know, real estate, in business, in industry, through tourists. You know, whenever you went uh, to Eastern or Central Europe, there was always a huge amount of Russian tourists. You know, some of them coming over, even just, you know, if you go to the border villages, they'll just drop over, you know, to shop you know, to buy goods and then go back, you know. Uh, so that trade is gone. So there's an economic effect. There's also the economic effects of the grain uh, deals being, you know, with rather than Ukrainians being able to take their grain out um, through by the sea, as it, as it used to happen, it's now going by road and coming into local markets and depressing prices for local farmers. So there, there is that backlash. There is also the, um, there were two other factors. And one is the, um, what I would say, the, the, the kind of cultural backlash. Now, Central and Eastern Europe, you know, going all the way to Russia, is a melting pot. There have been empires, Austro-Hungarian Empire, the, you know, the Roman Empire, the Russian Empire, the Ottoman Empire. All of these empires clashed in that region. And all of these peoples are mixed, you know. So when we look at Europe, we always think of it as a homogeneous place. Ukraine is not homogeneous. Russia is a homogeneous. There, there is a history of each of these cultures clashing with each other. So a little bit of those tensions manifest. But then the final part is the, is the actual partisan side of it. So as I said, there is no party in the UK uh, that would ever stand up and say we shouldn't support Ukraine. But there are politicians in Central Europe and Eastern Europe who will voice this. Many of them are, to be brutal and sponsored by Russia, but some of them are actually speaking to uh, a constituency within Russia. I, I know people, you know, in that region who, when the war started, was, were ready to join up and go and volunteer and fight the Russians. Uh, now they're... Um, Attitude has changed generally because, you know, they're, they're a little bit war weary and they're becoming, you know, victim to, you know, using some of the talking points that the Russians would use. So there is that kind of element of war weariness within the region, which it doesn't necessarily affect things, but it's something to look at. It's something to be aware of that this war cannot be seen in isolation. It has to be seen in the wider European context, it has to be seen in the, in the wider European context of Central and Eastern Europe having been the battleground for so many different empires, so many different emotions, and many of these countries are experiencing independence for the first time, and they're thriving. You know, ever since they became independent of the Soviets uh, back in 1990, joined the EU sometime in the 90s, they, they're, they're thriving. You go there and there's new railways, new roads, big shopping malls, you go up even into the mountains, there's Wi-Fi, there's light, it's, it's just, it's really like, you know, any Western country. And what they're, the, the big terror terror for all of them is going back to being under Russian subjugation and losing all these benefits that they've got and the ability to travel, uh, which is, again, another big advantage for them. So one has to take all of that into context when you're thinking about um, the Ukrainian uh, humanitarian situation, the Ukrainian war. It's not as easy for us, maybe, 
in the UK or in Africa looking at it divorce. For these people, it, it's, it's a reality. Um, but the, the, con the, the, the short summary of it is that Ukrainians are still welcome, but there are still those kind of caveats that one has to look at that, if not you know, addressed properly, you know, the cultural, the economic, the, uh, and all of that can become problematic. If President Joe Biden of the United States wanted to get more money for funding of the war in Ukraine or the U.S. military and financial support, one of the first senators that will probably sign off on it is Senator Lindsey Graham, who has been physically in Ukraine and has also championed the cause of Kiev. But for those who are watching the elections to take place in the United States next year and considering that if he... Um, overcomes all the obstacles in front of him. Former President Donald Trump gets, it, gets in the saddle again that he will help to de-escalate the war. But he does have a lot of obstacles, one of which is his recent arrest and the mugshot that he took uh, in the police uh, station, which, by the way, has made him, what, $7 million from the photo of his being arrested in the United States, which speaks to the support he has in the United States, and maybe also feeds into the narrative that he's, they're trying to stop him because they can't beat him, uh, weaponizing the, the DOJ, Department of Justice, and the political machinery in the United States. What do you think will happen next year in the U.S. if there is a change of God at the U.S. presidency? So that is um, the... Um the, the, the $100 million question um, in that when we look at this war, there were certain key milestones that all come together at the same point and at the same time. And that key milestone is the year 2024. Why is that a key uh, milestone? The key, the, the, the big issue are the elections. There are Russian elections, there are US elections, there, are, there, there might be British elections, uh, there should be Ukrainian elections. There are also elections in other Euro key European countries. This is this, and all of those elections affect um, the, the, the outlook of the war in certain ways. Why is this? So I'll break it down into two things: why it's important, and you know uh, what what it means, maybe particularly for the US point of view. So you know the, the big. If we break the war down into the strategic, the operational, the tactical, we'll, we'll look at the tactical phase, which is you know what's happening now, the, the counteroffensive. Uh, by the Ukrainians. Now that's going, it's going slowly by, you know, as everyone seems to be saying, but it, it's actually going well. It's doing what it should do. Uh, but the Russians, as I, you know, as I've said many times on this program, the Russians are also doing what they should do. They're, they're fighting back quite well. So it, that's kind of, that's, that's battlefield fortune. Whatever happens there, you know, or, you know, as terrible as it is for the young men who have to fight this war, you know, that's, that's out of the, 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 the question. Neither side is going to be able to comprehensively defeat each other on the battlefield. That's just not going to happen. So on the operational side of life, the Russians need to hold the ground as, for as long as they can, uh, while the Ukrainians need to take ground, as, as much ground as they can, particularly before winter sets in. So operationally, each side has their key uh, kind of objective. For the Ukrainians, is to take as much ground as possible that they can threaten the Russian, um, the Russian um, lines in particular. Um, whilst, for the, you, as I said, for the Russians, is to hold them back. But strategically, the key way for Russia to win this war is to separate Ukraine from its Western allies. The Europeans will always support Ukraine. But once the Americans drop off, that's the big, you know, always to be to be crude, the big sugar daddy in the in you know in the corner that without that that can keep Ukraine going indefinitely. Uh, it has the industrial capacity, it has the wealth, it has so much surplus weapons that it can throw it everything it, it wants at Ukraine without you know without breaking a sweat. To be honest, so that's why the big strategic imperative of Russia has been to sow doubt about the Ukrainian war amongst uh, Americans in particular. And it's been very successful. As we alluded to earlier, you know, they have this effort in Europe and it's quite successful, but it's, it's, it's isolated in the areas that you expect it to be isolated in in Europe, in the extreme left and in the extreme right and in the conspiracy theory, anti-COVID type people. So we know where, it, where, you know where, that, we know where that layer is. But in America, they've very successfully penetrated the, the Republican Party. And there's not a single, there are very few Republicans who are serious contenders who are pro-Ukraine. You know, the people who are making the most noise, Trump, uh, I think Vivek uh, Raswami, 
you know, uh, even Ron DeSantis, who's supposed to be the guy who would challenge Trump, are all Ukraine kind of skeptics. Mm. Uh, so the Russians, yeah. their big strategic objective is to make sure that A, um, a Republican wins and an anti-Ukraine Republican wins. And that person obviously is Trump. Um, but also it's to uh, continue generating that doubt and giving that groundswell of doubt in, 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 in the United States. Now, Trump is most likely going to be the nominee. It doesn't matter what happens. No one's going to beat him in the primary. Um, and if he is, he, he apparently has a plan. But the problem is with Trump, the biggest problem we always before we start, we always have with Trump as you know analyst is his unpredictability. He, he generally follows whatever the last person you know he meets says to him. So while he's very anti-Ukraine now, uh, or, or not maybe not anti-Ukraine, but you know making um, comments about you know uh, making a deal and ending the war and how and on, you know he could take office and decide all of a sudden well he wants to do Ukraine better than Biden and you know triple whatever Biden has done. It's a, it's, a, it's a crazy gamble for the Russians because right. Trump is very unpredictable. And um, I think the final point I'm going to make is that, as I said, the Russian timing is always based on this US political calculation. So if we look back to the Kherson offensive of last year, they delayed the pullout until after the US midterms because they didn't want to hand Biden a victory. Now, they will do the same thing now. They will hang on as best as they can until November 2024 to try and give Trump a victory or Biden a defeat. And that is going to be, you know, how battlefield, the battlefield rhythm is dictated from the Russian side. Thank you so much, Mr. Wanu. Let's uh, leave our conversation with what the Russian president said on his intent concerning Ukraine. Remember, you recall him saying that the people of the areas, including Luhansk and Zaporizhia, uh, are going to be Russian citizens forever. So that's something that is just another... Tough pill to swallow if that happens. Thank you so much, Mr. Chidiwanu, security expert, to join us from out of London. Thank you for having me. After the break, German citizens protest to denounce Western countries for escalating Russia-Ukraine conflict by supplying Ukraine with weapons. Details in a moment. Please stay with us. Welcome to the Sophomore stretch of today's coverage of Russian invasion of Ukraine. Now in Germany, over the weekend, crowds of German citizens rallied in Dusseldorf, the capital city of North Rhine-Westphalia, the most populous state of Germany, to denounce Western countries for escalating the Ukraine crisis by supplying Ukraine with weapons. The protesters held banners and placards reading, We want peace, no war, weapons don't create peace demanding the United States and other Western countries immediately stop sending weapons to Ukraine, they denounced North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, for wantonly waging wars around the world for their own interest. On a list of German weapons that will be provided to Ukraine, two sets of Patriot air defense systems were included, while some German politicians still suggested the government to supply Ukraine with longer-range Taurus cruise missiles. The potential delivery of more weapons has aroused strong concerns amongst the protesters in Germany, with many criticizing the German government of escalating tensions abroad while neglecting its own domestic problems. The tough sanctions imposed by the EU on Russia have caused a severe energy crisis in Germany and further pushed up inflation. Germany's economic growth stalled in the second quarter of the year, with surveys showing that German businesses are losing confidence in the economic outlook. I think uh, NATO, NATO has been uh, waging wars in their own interests all over the world during the last decades. They invaded Libya, they invaded Afghanistan, they invaded Iraq. We do not consent to the German government sending heavy weapons into a hot war zone because weapons do not create peace. They only prolong and increase the human suffering in Ukraine. We want Germany to undertake diplomatic initiatives and to stop sending heavy weapons. We have a lot of problems, economic problems here now in Germany. That's why I'm also here uh, by the protest. A second ship has left Ukraine's port city of Odessa since Moscow's withdrawal from the Black Sea grain deal. Ukrainian lawmaker Alexei Honcherenko says the Liberia flag bulk carrier Primus has set sail for Bulgaria. Primus is moving from Odessa to the port of Varna in Bulgaria. 
Odessa's three seaports shipped tens of millions of tons of grain during Russia's invasion under a UN brokered deal which collapsed in July after Moscow withdrew. Russian forces have since targeted Ukrainian ports with volleys of missiles and kamikaze drones. Now let's get down to brass tacks with the business side of things of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Ini John Mecca is in the studios to furnish us with more information and insight. Ini, good morning. Good morning. Happy Monday. Happy Monday to you. Uh, European gas prices, again, top $400. I, just, I was reading recently that even the Americans are complaining that their gas prices are high and they're accusing President uh Putin. Uh, Joe Biden, you know, the oh, Americans, okay. uh, of the Bidenomics thing, as they term it now, that it's not working, but that's uh, <laughs> different schools of thought in the United States. What's with the European gas prices now? Yeah, so what's happening with the European gas uh, price? And this will come as a bit of a surprise because as of last weekend, uh, Europe had come to say that they are confident that um, the price is stable now because they have a target of um, the 1st of November to fill their reserves with their gas for energy for the winter period, you know. And so they were so confident that things are going to be off okay. They already did 90% of uh, what they have, what they need to have for okay. storage. Uh, unfortunately for them, now, um, we know that Russia used to be a major supplier of gas or energy source for them, for EU, Ukraine, and all of that. Uh, but because of the war and because of the sanctions, they've had to turn to Australia. Now, Australian workers in the LNG uh, sector have been uh, calling for better pay and better working condition and all of that. And so now they are threatening strike. In fact, they're they are meeting today uh, to talk about that. And this is the same Australia that just hosted the World Cup. <laughs> Imagine how the world is going. So, you know, um, the two major facilities are, are set to go on strike today. And Australia uh, 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 supplies one tenth of what the world uses global supply. So you can imagine there are two major facilities. I mean, the workers are meeting today. All the smaller facilities have already agreed to go on strike. They're a strong ally of Ukraine, by the way. Australia, that is. Yes, they are. But I mean, as we always say, countries will have to take care of themselves first before mm -hmm. taking care of other countries. So at this point, is the union, the workers that are asking for better pay. But inflation is everywhere. So it's not easy for government to just, you know, close their eyes and say, we're going to give you better pay. You know, so they feel that they want to drive home their point by going on strike. And once they go on strike, it means no work, um, uh, no gas supply. So right. that means supply is already threatened. And a lot of countries, including the EU, have turned to Australia for gas supply since uh, they are no longer in good terms with Russia. Mm -hmm. But see the irony of it. Just today also, as they're talking about, you know, the high price and everything, Ukraine's Gazprom is using, um, uh, sorry, Russia's Gazprom yeah. is using R Ukraine as a thoroughfare to transport more than 41 million metric tons of gas that is going to sell. Which has not been stopped by Ukraine. Which, no, it, I it mean, cannot be. It, it can be. They're paying for it. It's a business deal. You understand? Right. So even in the midst of the war, yes, you, you <laughs> even in the that. midst of war, I mean, they're still doing business on the one hand. On the other hand is the fact that this is what they need. But because of the sanctions and because of their sentiments, you understand, they cannot buy from Russia. They have to look all the way to Australia. And unfortunately, Australia has a problem now, talking about EU and even Ukraine. So what does that mean for the man on the street in Australia and in all these nations around the world? Gas for their cars, now petrol, is that going to be harder to get? or the subsidiary so products? So more of energy, electricity. You know, they it's very cold there. So they, yeah. they do a lot of heater in their homes, just as we do more of air conditioning for cool weather. They do more of the warmth, yeah. you know. So it's going to be more difficult, more expensive for the man on the street. And, uh, of course, uh, you just talked about how some people in, in Germany are protesting there. It leads to more protests. And, of course, the issue of health also comes into play here because, I mean, they're cold 
is really cold. The winter period is really cold for them. And heat is not an option uh, uh, as it is for us. They need it to survive. They need it to warm their houses and, and, you know, apart from cooking and all of that. So it becomes more expensive for them. We're talking of inflation. It gets even worse. Uh, uh, the pay package becomes less valuable to the common man. And, of course, the common man will cry out to the government, you know, that Indeed. you should do something We're about fast it. fast approaching the autumn and the winter season. Yes, that's why um, the EU had that target, you know, of filling their storage by the 1st of November. And they were so confident about it. But, you know, the thing is, with storage, uh, you don't just fill it and leave it. You're going to continue using it. So if you're not Stop. topping it up at this time... Yeah then you may start using it beforehand. That means by winter, you'll be worse off. And if it's more expensive now, I learned it went even as high as 50, 500 euro, and then it now tapered. But I mean, with the strike likely to begin today, uh, it's another squeeze on supplies. Finally, Binance no longer offers P2P traders option to pay through sanctioned Russian banks. Mm -hmm. Will you translate what I just read into English? <laughs> I thought that was English. <laughs> so, so, of course, we know that a lot of banks, Russian banks, are sanctioned. And we know that Russia is looking to the crypto space, you know, the decentralized banks to, to carry out their uh, uh, transactions, especially uh, with outside Russia as a way of payment. So what Binance has done is that, for instance, if you want to if you want to pay, you want to buy or sell on Binance, you would see individuals with their banks. That's where you transfer your money or you, they transfer to you. So what it means for that, because that's P to P, pair to pair. That means you can't do such transactions with any Russian bank that has been sanctioned. They're going to put it off. And of course, that makes it more difficult for them. And remember, they have that there, uh, 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 ruble, you know, that's coming up also, just yes. ways to. Yes. So yes, this, is, this is another squeeze on them. And the question is, if Binance will put further sanctions on them, that's on Russians, and, and, and that will make it even more difficult and might be a threat to their e-payments and, and that they're trying to use. So that remains to be seen. Thank you, Eni. Thank you Business for Business English me. is not English. It's, <laughs> it's Greek. Oh, okay. In business. <laughs> All right. Business speaks. Thanks, Eni. <laughs> Thank Eni you for Megra. Me. <laughs> When we return, whatever it takes, Russian architect calls for a raid on nightclubs to catch drug up sinners and send them to the front line details in a moment please stay with us welcome to the final stretch of today's edition of russian invasion of ukraine working as an investigative reporter in russia russian journalist elena kostyachenko says you always have to be careful despite the murders of four of her colleagues for their reporting she never considered she'd been poisoned when she fell ill on a train to Berlin. German prosecutors are investigating whether Alina, who is now living in hiding, was the victim of an attempted murder when she became ill last October. Her symptoms started with disorientation and stomach ache on the train journey from Munich to Berlin and persisted for several weeks. By the time she realized she may have been poisoned, it was too late to identify any toxins. In the past, enemies of Russian President Vladimir Putin living abroad have been poisoned, including former secret agent Sergei Skripal, you may remember him, who survived, and Sergei Lit uh, Litvienko, who did not. Former Chechen rebel died in Berlin in what a German court said was a Russian state assassination. However, the Kremlin denies involvement with these killings. I decided that I would go public, so... I would raise the cost, you know, of assassination attempt because one case, then like you just die because of, you know, unknown illness and uh, it's such a story. Mm. And I uh, approached some Russian doctors and some Israeli doctors and they also got no idea. So, um, and then, and also my symptoms were changing during that time. Uh, mm. My pain in stomach got less and I got less dizzy. Uh, but like my face 
started swelling and then my fingers and I had to took off my like my rings because like my fingers looked like a sausages and the, like it fitted for you know Putin's narrative like but we can't forgive traitors and of course I can understand how secret services can consider Litvinenko and Skripal as traitors but I was never working with like secret services. I'm I'm an independent journalist. So somehow I was thinking that, yeah, that like in Europe, I'm safe. You know, when you work as an investigative reporter in Russia, you are always careful. You have lots of protocols you're following all the time. You know how to, to communicate with people, how to approach people, how to travel between cities, how to do things. But then I found uh, on myself in Europe, I totally forgot about all these security measures. Like then I discussed like my trip to Munich. I used like Facebook Messenger, like for Christ's sake. Like it's totally unsafe, you know, channel for communication. But somehow it just didn't appear in my head that I can be here at risk too. In Russia, a popular Russian cleric has called for a raid on nightclubs to catch who he calls drugged up sinners and send them to the front line of the war in Ukraine. Andrei Kachev, who is also the former head of the missionary department of the Kiev diocese, has called for a conscription raid on nightclubs, arguing such venues are full of, quote, healthy, sexually mature stallions who should be fighting for Russia at the conflict instead. The priest, who is known for controversial statements, made the suggestion while speaking to Russian television on Sunday, born in the western Ukrainian city of Lvov, he moved to Russia in 2014 following the Madden coup and the beginning of the conflict in Donbass prior to moving to Russia. He held a senior post with the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, which was then subordinate to the Moscow Patriarchate and served as the head of the missionary department of the Kiev diocese. Russia's advanced weapons, including those used in Ukraine, have been displayed in the town of Kabinka, where the Army's 2023 International Military Technical Forum has ended. State-of-the-art weapons were displayed like the world's only next-generation tank, the T-14 Amata. The Kroganet Infantry Fighting Vehicle, the Krasnopol Artillery Shell. This exhibition is said to have drawn quite a few foreign buyers, as well as a lot of local Russian residents interested in seeing the military might of their country. Before the Ukraine operation started, Many of the components needed for local weapons production were not made in Russia, and Western sanctions have targeted deliveries. But Russia's domestic military-industrial complex hasn't faltered in arms production, including in computer chips. Viktor Litovkin, a retired colonel of the Russian army, says all the equipment in the weapons are made in Russia. And this is where we call it a day for today's coverage of Russian invasion of Ukraine. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Illuminae Macaulay. Have a great week and a good day.